Hi everybody, it's Jeff Hopper with Jeffrey Cranford. Yeah. You know, Jeff, one of the things that uh, bothers me sometimes when I watch golf on TV, and I watch a fair bit of golf on TV, is that some of the guys who are experts in the game spend a lot of time breaking down the swing. Right. And I know it's interesting to you, but I think to the average golfer, there are a lot of other things that they could be talking about that would be helpful rather than breaking down a professional swing. Right, right. What are some things that we can learn about the game besides the swing that would be helpful for an average player like me? Well, there's so many intangibles in golf, as we all know. Uh, I can go back through, I mean, all the way back to college. And I uh, played in the Southwest Conference back in the day. Contemporaries were John Daly. A little, he's a little younger than I am now, but... Uh, Steve Elkington and you know Billy Ray Brown and Bob Estes and Jeff Maggard and all these guys that were playing in our conference and then you look at the guys and you say okay who had the most just raw talent and there's some guys that I could give you and I won't give you their name but I said oh that guy's gonna make it and then this guy I, you know he's okay but he's not gonna make it when I had the opportunity to play a little on the European tour I played with a couple of guys ball striking wise one of them uh, was just one of the most incredible ball strikers I'd ever seen. Incredible ball striker, and you would have never heard of him. I saw him over here. He was competitive in one web.com event one time, and after that you really didn't hear anything about him. He was saying, what is it apart from his golf swing, his mechanics? And, and of course, a lot of that revolves around attitude, revolves around uh, management, course management. I mean, obviously very significant things. Being able to read a lie or read the greens or, or, or just your ability to have a game plan are gigantic things in terms of golf. But at the end of the day, there is a little something on the inside of certain people that's, uh, that says, I belong here. And then for other people, I don't. And you can see it. Some guy even on the club championship or just a, just a round with your buddies. He's up on the first tee going, I do not belong here. I don't know why I'm doing this. I, I don't. And I struggled with that my whole career. You know, I'd get up and I'd play with a name or play with somebody that was, and I'm like, what am I doing here? And other guys get there and they don't have a track record and they get up and for whatever reason, I think back at Patrick Reed, you know, when he claimed I'm one of the top four or five best players in the world when he had only won a time or two. And yet in his mind, I absolutely belong here. I will be that. He got a lot of criticism from that, but those are some of those intangibles. Right, intangibles. Um, when Paul was praying for the Colossians, there were a series of things he was praying that we've been looking at. And he prayed that they would increase in the knowledge of God. Yeah. When I think of God and knowing God, you know, a lot of times we think of the big things. Well, God is love and God is merciful. But God is infinite in his attributes. Very much. And we can get to know him in a lot of ways that aren't so obvious. Very much. What are some of those? What are, what are maybe an attribute or two where most people aren't thinking of that, but it's very much our God? Well, I, just because I, this is fresh on my mind, I had been, I'd done a series not long ago on this, and it was the wrath of God. Wow. And the wrath of God gives us insight in not just a mean, arbitrary God who uh, just well, likes to smite people. It's about His holiness, and I think we far underestimate God's holiness. We treat him a little bit cavalierly at times. Of course, in the culture, you see it all the time. The man upstairs, it's a Santa Claus type figure. It's a somebody that's just up there to make your life better and grant your wish like a genie in a bottle. And then you get these encounters that you get in the Bible with Isaiah and others that fall. They just get into the presence, even not even seeing his face. The Bible says you can't see his face and live. No man can see the face of God live. And these godly men, by our standards, fall on their face when they get into the presence of God. Think of Isaiah going, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm ruined. Well, that's knowledge of God. And if you don't have an appropriate knowledge of who you're dealing with, and I think this is the overriding understanding here, is that you won't live a life that's uh, well-balanced, that's uh, in, done in knowledge. And I think that's what right. Paul is trying to get at here. You know, try to have an understanding of God, not just your little things that may come from culture or other places. I want to ask you one other question here. Because you and I are Bible guys. And I think sometimes people confuse or conflate knowledge of the Bible right. with knowledge of God. How are those connected but different? 
Yeah, well, certainly we get our knowledge of God through the scripture. We know that. But, and that's the foundation, but experience is also important. So I would always say the foundation, my experience, I do not let my experience lead in my understanding of orthodoxy. I go to the text for that. But I allow my experience to give me a deeper understanding once I'm founded in the text. So I think oftentimes you get a new believer and they say, well, I'm having this experience and that experience and this experience. And I said, well, let's measure those against the text. But like I said, you can't just have the text because it can become dead orthodoxy. It has to be orthopraxy where you actually get out and practice your orthodoxy, your understanding of God's nature so that you can sense his presence through the, you know, and we talk about this all the time. It's a relationship. It's not just a religion. Yeah, it's a relationship. And so we seek to know God as well as we can. Very much. In all his attributes. In all his attributes. Yeah. And we know that much. I mean, it's like an ant trying to understand the atomic bomb. I mean, you just, or how to, you know, you just can't, can't fathom that world. Right. And yet we're creating his, ima his image and he calls us into relationship. It's a staggering thing when you begin to think about it. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks, buddy. And we'll see you all next time.